Okay, so my name is Shelly Witt, and I'm a clinician. I'm an audiologist, and I work um, with Rich in the Tinnitus and Hyperacusis Clinic. And I just want to know, how is everybody feeling? It's been a big day, a lot of information. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to take up a lot of time. Um, I'm going to try to be informative, and um, the only person in here who is allowed to fall asleep is Rich, because he knows me. <laughs> the rest of you can't. Um, before I start, I just want to thank all the speakers, but Matthew, is he in here? Right there. Um, if you are a clinician who works with tinnitus patients, Matthew's story is kind of perfect, and it really sets the stage for what I'm going to talk about and what we're going to talk about tomorrow. And what we really want is our tinnitus patients who are greatly bothered to end up where Matthew ended up. But I think he made it very clear in his slides when he showed, you know, pictures of this and this, that that's where a lot of our patients start. And they maybe don't have the resources or tools to get to where he ended up. And it seems like you were kind of a self-motivator. I mean, Mayo Clinic really helped you and set you straight, but then you took it to the next level. And I think I have seen a lot of patients who can't get to that next level unless they have a professional helping them, OK? So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, real quick, and Rich doesn't know I'm going to do this, so I'm probably going to get in big, big trouble. But years ago, when I started in this field, we would get cold calls all the time, and we still do. But I would get cold calls from clinicians who would say, you know, what do I do? I want to help these tinnitus patients, but what do I do? And now the cold calls are, where do I start? And I think that's really neat, because that shows there are lots of options out there. So I get lots of cold calls, and so I'm going to just briefly show you what we do here so that you can um, you know, think about that and maybe you know, use some of this information or not in, in your own uh, professional situations. OK, so where do we start? If a tinnitus patient calls in, they call into our clinic, and we, the front desk staff, knows what to say. We always recommend, we can't enforce, but we recommend an ENT visit, OK? Um, the purpose of the ENT visit is not to be diagnosed or get an answer, but to make sure that you're medically healthy. So we really appreciate that visit. And we'll get a lot of patients who are grumpy about that. Oh, I went to my ENT and all kinds of tests, and in the end, nothing. Well, no, nothing is good. So we really like that ENT visit. Let's make sure that your patient is medically healthy. Step two, we encourage our patients to attend what we call a tinnitus group education session. OK? And in that session, then they decide if they want to go to an individual tinnitus session. And the group session is really cool, and I'm going to tell you what that's about. But it's neat because you might have patients who are curious or uh, want to know what the current status is. And that session can really answer a lot of questions. And sometimes people peel off, and we never see them again. Okay, So what is that session? It's an hour and a half. It's anywhere from 3 to 20 people. We encourage them to bring their most current hearing test. And we encourage them to bring a friend or a family member. Now, there's a cost for the patient, but there's no cost for their partner. Okay, And this is a really cool session because it's semi-formal. Um, you know, we manage the session, but it's small enough that people get the opportunity to go around the room and introduce themselves and say a little bit about themselves and their story. Um, it's not over-dominated with individual stories, but enough so people get a sense of, ah, that person, you know, is dealing with that or this one's dealing with that. And a little bit of talk, cross-talk to maybe give some suggestions. Um, but what we do go over is the prevalence of tinnitus, the causes of tinnitus, description of the hearing mechanism, and then we talk about the common reactions to tinnitus. And again, go around the room and we share some of that. And then ideally, what are the options? 
And then we do also include hyperacusis mechanisms and treatment. What are the options? That's what everybody wants to know. But I think until you go through that session and you really understand some of those things, you might not understand what option you want. And I really feel these are the main options. Sound therapy and tinnitus counseling and some kind of combination. And it's really as simple as that. Now, if someone wants to only consider sound therapy, in our group session, Rich and I briefly go over some of the sound therapy devices, not in any detail, and we lay out some general costs. So some people say, I just want a device. I want to go that route. And other people don't. Well, if you want to go that route, I love this session, and I highly um, recommend you consider putting it in your clinics. It's a three-hour session, and we fit everything that's wearable that we feel that we have found to be helpful with various patients. So that includes a basic masking device with no amplification. What happens when you put a masker in your ears? We purposely use ITE and BTE styles because some people need or want an ITE for better sleep, okay? Um, a combination device can be whatever manufacturer you love or prefer. You can have a couple if you want, but it needs to be a combination device with some type of masker included with some broadband noise so you can adjust. And by the way, I just wanted to remind you, all of my whole presentation will be on the website. So if you don't want to take notes, don't feel like you have to. Um, I think you need um, a Widex Zen product there because that's unique compared to some broadband noise. And it's interesting, people will come in, I don't like fractal tones, I heard them on the internet. You put them in their ear and they're in love with them. You know, Claudia's um, slide with the thumbprint, you, you just cannot assume and you cannot predict until they come in and you try these things. Um, we fit the Neuromonics Oasis and we fit the Sound Cure Serenade, okay? Um, patients leave this session knowing if sound therapy is even an option. And sometimes I say, oh, not sometimes, always, when patients come in, we have what are called statement of understandings before every session. It's a little paragraph. It says, this is why you're here. This is kind of what we're doing, and this is the cost. So they know and we know, so there's no confusion. And a lot of times um, patients leave this session. I tell them this up front. You may leave, and none of these devices will be helpful. And that's OK, because then that means you don't have to sit on the internet and look at the marketing, which the marketing is beautiful with all of them, and it should be, and wonder. Because sometimes people get caught in that marketing, and they, they don't know where to turn, but they think that the device is going to do what we hopefully want it to do, but sometimes it just doesn't. OK? So it's a great session. Um, if a patient is not interested in sound therapy wearable devices, then they can turn to tinnitus counseling. We have individual sessions. We can bundle a group of sessions. We offer telephone counseling and any combination. Now, we'll take telephone counseling, cold call counseling, but if um, a patient is highly bothered, I prefer to have a couple individual sessions so that there's face-to-face -face work before we switch over to the telephone, so I do make that recommendation. But we get um, patients from all over the United States and actually all over the world coming in, so it's really unrealistic to think that everything has to be done in the office, okay? All right, so again, what happens? We start with our group session. We get good information out there. The patients who are not bothered tend to leave. Patients who are more bothered look at the options and say, do I want to try sound therapy? Do I want to try counseling? Do I want to try a combination? And maybe they don't know, so then they start there and they kind of, we talk about it. Start in one spot, but move over to another. Um, we always use statements of understanding. 
and then we always have a goal. So, you know, Rich has said, what's your purpose for doing a test? We always have a goal for whatever we're doing so that we understand, is it reasonable and can we get there or do we need to change that goal? Is everybody good with that? Okay. Now, in our clinic, if you pursue tinnitus counseling, we use what's called tinnitus activities treatment approach. And it's broken down into four categories. One category is hearing. One category is concentration. One category is sleep. And another is thoughts and emotions. And thoughts and emotions is typically where most people fall when they're greatly bothered by their tinnitus. And I bet Matthew would agree with that. Um, but it can underlie all of the areas, really. Okay. Um, I'm in love with this questionnaire. Rich doesn't know I'm saying this. He's not paying me to say this. Um, it's internally when we were developing it, we called it the 12-item tinnitus activities questionnaire. Um, this is what it looks like. The name has changed. I think you can get it on our website. I'm not sure. Um, but 12 items, really simple. The patient's responsibility is to indicate how much they agree with each statement on a scale from 0 to 100. So if they really um, completely disagree with it, your numbers are real low. And if they say, oh yeah, oh yeah, I really agree with that, your numbers are high. Okay? It's broken into four sections that are consistent with the, the counseling that we provide. So you have concentration, emotion, hearing, and sleep, okay? So without even remembering these subcategories, this is one of my patient's responses. So without even knowing what the questions are, not even knowing what subcategories are, you can say, wow, they're way at the high end. So they're in that greatly bothered category. And if we look at the separate sections, which I can never remember unless I look, they cannot concentrate. They're not hearing very well. They're not sleeping well. The, the area they're least bothered by, but still pretty bothered by, is emotion. Okay? This is another patient. I would say this person also is falling on the high end. So we're looking at someone who's pretty bothered by their tinnitus. Maybe a little less than the other person, but I don't know. The, the sleep category is the, the lowest number. That's pretty high for not having you know, good sleep. OK, this is someone who actually has some variation. So let's see. The first category is concentration. They are not struggling at all. They can work. They can read. They can, you know, watch TV. Emotionally, though, yeah, they're not doing so well. They're really kind of struggling with some hearing, and they're sleeping pretty good. So when Claudia was talking about her clinic, um, you know, this is what she was saying she uses to help guide her in, you know, what she starts with with her patients. Okay, here's someone. They're having absolutely no hearing problems. That's the third category. But boy, they cannot sleep. And the second category, their emotions, they're really raw. And the top category, they're not doing so well with concentration. And I think this is my last one. OK? And these are all real patients. So um, they're the bottom one, they're really bothered with sleep. They're having no hearing problems. They are feeling pretty emotional, but man, they can concentrate just fine, OK? Oh, I guess I have one more, sorry. <laughs> so this person, what? what do we know? Cannot concentrate. Emotionally, they think they're doing OK, but look at that 100. And that question is, my emotional peace is one of the worst effects of my tinnitus, and there's 100 there. So. They're not having problems with much depression, which is question five, and they're really not feeling anxious, but boy, there's something going on you know, mentally that they're struggling with. But they can sleep, they can hear, 
but they're, they cannot concentrate. So I wonder if because they can't concentrate, then that emotional component is, is kind of hooked to it. Okay. So um, we call this questionnaire, am I correct? Tinnitus Primary Function Questionnaire. And um, there is an article out there about its development and its validity. But if you want to know things like statistically, how do you get, you know, what's, what's the statistical improvement, I don't, you would have to talk to Rich, and I don't know if we really looked at that. But in general, you want to see them get better, right? So you just know that a high number is not good, and the lower we get, the better. And at what point can we say they're, you know, doing pretty good? Okay. All right, so. Let's pretend like you have a cons consultation room and you have a patient sitting in there and they're waiting for you and you're going to go in and do some tinnitus activities treatment and their questionnaire responses were way up at the high end. They don't want devices. They do not believe they have a hearing loss. What do you do? Way. Yeah. You educate, but before you even educate, what do you do? Yep. So when you go in, if you're totally lost and you don't know where to start, we have some resources for you, and I would say it starts with our introduction section of our activities treatment. Okay? Now, what is this treatment? Well, it's a counseling and sound therapy-based program. It's picture-based. It's focused on the individual. Now, we know that in these areas, right? The thoughts, the hearing, the sleep, the concentration. It's provided for free on our website. So you can go in and print them off, download them, bring in a laptop com computer. It's a series of pictures. And we like pictures because it helps keep us kind of organized, helps us remember not to overlook important concepts. It's an easy format. And you can really structure some little mini lectures, OK? This is what it looks like on the website. So each section has a review section. So if you go through a section and then the patient comes back, you can go in and review and talk about how their week went or how some of these, you know, uh, topics have gone. There's no right or wrong. You can use the pictures however you want. There's no specific order other than as you walk into that room for the first time, if you're feeling a little nervous, if it's the first time you've worked with a tinnitus patient and you know they're in that greatly bothered category, I would recommend you start with the introduction, okay? Um, go through all of them as a clinician before you have time or before you sit down with the patient because there are techniques in one area you might use in another area. Um, but the area you're going to spend the most time in is the thoughts and emotions area. They're not easy concepts. They're not easy for everyone to incorporate into their life, but they can be the most helpful. So Matthew's story is still amazing. The end result is what you want. But to get someone there sometimes isn't easy. They don't want to meditate or they may not want to do yoga, but in the end, they might end up. And so this area is really helpful. You can print out any of the slides. You can use them as handouts. Now, tomorrow, um, I'm presenting and I'm in one of the breakout sessions. I have tons of handouts for you guys. They'll all be on the website. But we have a nice handout for each section of this treatment. And uh, handouts are great because people can't remember everything. And then you can use them as a homework assignment. So the part of the activities that I like in this therapy is you can't always guarantee people are going to do what we educate them to do. So I just assign homework. And homework can be written on the back or highlight a section, try this. And when they come back, then you can talk about what they did. I don't know about you, but I know I need to exercise and I don't. 
But if I had a trainer, I would, because I would be paying, and I would feel forced to, and my trainer would be waiting for me. That's kind of what happens in tinnitus counseling. Um, you need to direct and be helpful, and sometimes homework is the only way to do it. Um, we do use a tinnitus diary. If you've never used one, it also is a great place to start. So after your introduction, it could be as simple as explaining the diary, telling the person to come back in a week. That could be your first session with homework. Okay, so what happens in the introduction? This is where I think a tinnitus clinician is unique. And I think you can do this, and it sets yourself apart from um, all the other areas of, of uh, audiology that we provide services in. The introduction is just for us 50 minutes of sitting in a room and letting the patient tell their story. You're going to start educating, as someone said, but before you educate, you've got to know what you're educating. And so most patients, not all, but most, say they just don't get this opportunity. The busy clinic is not where you're going to get it. In an ENT clinic, Dr. Hansen is wonderful. I love working with him. But he's not going to give you 50 minutes to listen to your story. He can't, right? If you go right into devices in a busy uh, clinic where they're fitting hearing aids, you may get it, but sometimes not because your day is packed with you know, testing hearing and fitting devices and following up. So it, this is really unique, but it's very, very helpful. Um, you'll do more listening than talking, and it's going to validate their journey. And I don't remember who today, which talk, but someone said validate. If you can validate what they've been through, you can start to actually help them de-stress. Now, I don't know Matthew's full story, but I'm wondering if was there a point at some point where someone really listened to you and let you kind of talk about this thing. I mean, I don't, I've never even heard of visual snow. So then I'm sure you didn't when you got it. And how would that feel if you had a professional who, who said, you know, it's, it's awful, isn't it? It, it really sucks, and, I, and listen to you and really understand emotionally how you're feeling, and I can't underplay this, and I know I sound like I'm like preaching, but um, when you work with a tinnitus patient who's really bothered, this can be so meaningful, and it can really set the stage for what you do next. These are pictures. I'm just giving you snapshots of what the pictures are like. The introduction is so simple, you hardly need a slide, but where do you want to start? What do you think caused your tinnitus? This is how you get that conversation going, OK? When your tinnitus began, what was your life like? You know, put this into context with Matthew. If someone asked you these things, geez, I just went out to dinner with friends. Woke up, why did that happen? Um, how has it influenced your life? What has changed? And then. Eventually, after 30, 40, 50 minutes, you need to get to, OK, how do you think we can help you? And this can start helping you set some goals. Remember, I'm goal, 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 goal oriented. What's your short-term goal? What's your long-term goal? How can we help? After the introduction, then I bleed easily, seamlessly into information. Um, in the thoughts and emotions section, there are many, many parts, and it gets kind of thick. But everybody here can do part one. And that is going over information with your patient on hearing and hearing loss. And you know, we are audiologists, so we know it, we get it. We, we forget that most people don't. So I don't know, months ago I was at something, I don't know. And I, it was somewhat audiology related, but a lot of non-audiologists. And I just ask people, do you, do you think we have an organ of hearing? Did you know we have an organ of hearing? How many organs of hearing do you think we have? Do we even have any? Most people don't know that stuff. And this is a really neat time to get very, very, very in depth with the auditory system. You can't just say to a patient, spontaneous activity. That 
doesn't cut it. <laughs> because in today's world, when we're so electronically inclined, people say, why can't we get rid of tinnitus? You don't get it until you hear a day of lectures like we heard today and we saw all the graphs and you know the pathway going up and the pathway going down. But our patients don't know that. And once we teach that to them, then again they start to de-stress. The auditory system is very complex. So teach this section like you're going to teach a student who's going to take a national exam. And then I really do think you'll start to make a difference with your patients. So I already said this, but when you do this, you're providing knowledge, you're removing unknowns, misconceptions, fears, use the patient's own audiogram. If they don't have one, then maybe take the time to go you know, get one if you can in your clinic. Um, you should feel really comfortable with this. The more detail, the better. Okay, so these are just snapshots of slides that we use, very, very detailed. Okay, um, the other thing I wanna ask you is do you have a really good explanation for tinnitus? Like a really good one that the lay person who's not in the field really understands? That's great. If you don't, I'm happy to share one with you tomorrow in the breakout session. Um, and it is an explanation I heard from Robert Sweeto, and he's a researcher in this field years ago. And I love it, and I can hook it to today's, all of today's um, presentations. Eventually, you have to get to this. You have to let the patient know that currently there's no drug, no surgery, or other treatments that can reliably eliminate the source. We say this in our group session numerous times. But a lot of times it has to be reset, especially in the introduction, in the hearing loss tinnitus section, because patients are still holding on that, um, that, that, that there is, that they just haven't stumbled on it, or that you haven't given it to them yet. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to go through all the different sections real briefly. I'm not going to keep you here all day. Um, Sleep. If you have someone who has sleep problems, there's a sleep section, okay? Um, the basic information in here is what's normal sleep look like? What are things that affect our sleep? What are daytime activities to facilitate better sleep? What are evening activities to facilitate sleep? How do we prepare for sleep? What happens if we wake up at night? What happens if we wake up in the morning? This is loosely called sleep hygiene, and it needs to be discussed. It may not fix the sleep problem, but it's neat to talk about this, figure out their pattern, find out kind of where they're stuck. And um, I brought with me, and I should pull it out here, but I was looking through the other day I got in the mail from my Blue Cross Blue Shield there was a section in there on sleep, and I thought, oh, am I doing it all right? And I look in there, and everything we talk about, they talk about, except right now there are three new studies, one being done here at the University of Iowa, where they're using cognitive behavioral therapy for better sleep. So they're talking about sleep hygiene, but they're also talking about what you do with your thoughts while you're dealing with poor sleep if you're not seeing a sleep specialist, okay? So I would recommend when you look at the thoughts and emotions section that you apply some of that in this category as well, okay? So again, just some slides. This is normal sleep patterns. This is what typically happens. Some people don't even know this. Um, in this section, we do talk about progressive muscle relaxation and imagery training. Um, I highly recommend you have some handouts if you don't want to actually do it with your patient. If you're kind of nervous about that, have a handout that you give to them that you ask them to go use you know, over the course of the week. Does everybody know what imagery training is? Does anybody not know? 
Okay, imagery training is really simple. It's just daydreaming. But it's daydreaming in a way that takes you somewhere that's really pleasant, okay? So I'll give you just a little example. A couple years ago, Rich asked me if I wanted to join him on a trip to go talk, and I said yes, and I wanted to, but my life was really hectic, and I really didn't want to, but I did. It was one of those situations, and I got on the plane, and I was seated in the middle of two people, which is fine, but you know, it's not ideal. You're like this. And I sat down, and my seat was broken, and I've never had this experience in my life. It actually was pushed forward. So I was like this, and I thought, well, this cannot happen. And of course, you know, you have this much room, and then when we got up in the air, the person in front of me stretched out. So I was literally like this. And of course, what did I do? Where did my thoughts go? I am never doing this again. I can't believe Rich made me do this. You know, all these, you know, awful things. And I thought, I can't sit here for an hour and a half. I felt claustrophobic, anxious, and the whole bit. What are my choices? Muscle relaxation, which you can do, which, which no one knows you're doing, and imagery training. So in the past, my imagery training was taking my old farmhouse and adding on in my head, making it this beautiful mansion, which didn't happen, but we did add on. And then now I have the addition, so my imagery training was I'm middle-aged, so I was recapping different periods of my life and things I was, just something pleasant, and before you knew it, the flight was over. And I really didn't hate Rich. It all worked out in the end. That's imagery training. It's really simple and it can be very fun, but if you don't have a discussion with your patient and they don't know how to use it or do it, they could be missing that tool. Ah, and these are just, again, snapshots of the slides that you will use to go over all of this information. Um, if you've never talked about a worry diary, worry diaries are wonderful for sleep also. Um, sound in your spouse. Um, we always encourage people to use sound therapy, even if it's not a wearable device, in their home. Get their home enriched with some sounds, tabletop sound devices that, you know, um, present some sounds. Uh, the sleep pillow is an amazing pillow that has a great, um, real thin amplifier in it that patients can use sounds. Um, I always say, if a spouse is unhappy because they need quiet, then you just need to sleep apart for a while. I think the person with tinnitus trumps the spouse who doesn't have it, and if they need pure quiet, then I always recommend that you, know, you separate for a while. It's okay if you're not always in the same bed. All right, let's switch to concentration. What do you go over in this section? Basic information. What is concentration? Why is it important? What are the things that affect it? How does tinnitus affect it? Have this conversation with them. Um, it lets your patient really think about what are they really frustrated with? What are they really not able to do? Because in the beginning, sometimes it's everything. I can't concentrate, I can't sleep, and life is horrible. And that's true, but what's one thing you can do? Or what's something you used to do, but you can't now, but you would like to? What could we do there? And you won't know unless you have this conversation. Um, so again, I'm not going to go through this, but slides to help you have this conversation about, you know, how we concentrate better. Um, this is something you really should think about because it is very helpful. Some patients who are struggling with tinnitus who still are working, need to work, who can't take some time off, might find a really complex task overwhelming. They may have to switch it up. They, this is just a silly example, but data entry is kind of mindless, right? Can they do something simple rather than something complex that you have to think about? Or is it the opposite? Do they have a job that's really simple and then it makes the tinnitus so overwhelming that if they could get involved in a complicated task, that then they would feel better. Do you see what I mean? Okay. Um, I just want to remind everybody that there is, um, in the field of cognitive psychology, there is a divided attention theory that says 
that we only have limited capacity for our attention. And if we're over-focused, then it's, it's reasonable that we're having concentration issues. And you may notice with some of your patients who are bothered by their tinnitus that they'll say things like, I can't remember, I'm foggy, um, I used to be so sharp, I could multitask. <coughs> well, it may not be that they've lost all of those skills. It just may be that they're falling into this divided attention theory uh, profile, okay? Maybe reassure them that the more we work on managing the tinnitus, that the concentration will become easier. Some people have to adjust their work habits, and some people have to take a leave of absence, and sometimes that's really hard for people to do, and it's very emotional, and you may need to help them with that process. Okay. Next section, hearing and communication. This is easy, fun, you're an audiologist, you can do this. This would be one of those individuals who really possibly thinks they cannot hear well only because of the tinnitus. And it could be that the tinnitus is making it difficult for them, but they've rejected hearing aids, or they say, I don't have a hearing loss. Take away the tinnitus, and I would hear beautifully. And maybe you know your clinical gut's telling you that's not the case. This is the perfect time to talk about that. If they do a sound therapy evaluation, focus on do you hear your tinnitus less? Well, yeah, but I hear so well. You know, even though two weeks ago they saw an audiologist who did the same thing, but in a hearing aid clinic, and they rejected it. Um, they're there because they're bothered by their tinnitus. So this section just talks about communication, um, things that can be helpful, communication styles. If you're not gonna address your hearing loss, then you have to address your communication and you have to be able to guide people and let them know how they need to communicate with you so that you guys can have you know, a fulfilling conversation. So repair strategies and styles in this section. And then the last section is the biggie, thoughts and emotions. And there's a lot that goes in this section. I'm just gonna go over it real briefly and then tomorrow we'll kind of explode it a little bit more. There's a couple different sections here. And we start with attention, but you don't have to. But we think it's important to provide a clear explanation of the role of our conscious versus our subconscious with regard to attention. So what are the types of attention? How things capture our attention? How can we direct it? And why some things cannot be ignored? So we have slides that help you do that, okay? Um, we do have a conscious area, and we do have a subconscious, and typically we focus on one thing at a time. But it's really difficult, especially nowadays. There's a lot of things competing on our attention. Have you driven lately? Wow, you've got cell phones and texting and cars that have all kinds of stuff on the dashboard and people talking and kids and eating in the car. And I swear I saw someone eating soup in the car and driving. I mean, we are crazy with the way that we do not just simply focus on one thing at a time. I bought a new car a few years ago, and I was overwhelmed with all the stuff in the front. And I'm not joking. I had to order a standard. And they were like, you don't want a standard. I want a few buttons and a knob. And I had to special order it. There's a lot that distracts us these days. But even so, we have the ability to adjust that. If you've ever been in a store near a parent walking along, mom, 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 dad, 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 right? They know. That's their subconscious. They know there's a kid there. But their focus is somewhere else, right? We can do that. We can stop and then go, oh, yeah, what do you need? That's directing our attention, and these slides talk about that. Um, the reason why we talk about this is because no matter what you're doing, what goes from the subconscious up to the conscious, whether you like it or not, are things that are unusual, things that are important, things that are scary, and things that are unexpected. 
and tinnitus falls in that category. So when tinnitus comes on and you fall in that category of being greatly bothered, it's okay. It's okay that it's here and it's all that you're thinking about because it kind of should be. That's your physiology. But how long do we want it to sit there and what do we want to do next to try to calm it so we can allow you to attend to other things? And in my opinion, we have to start with linking our thoughts with our emotions, okay? That's where we start to calm some of this and get it to fall into our subconscious, okay? We have three types of thoughts. We're humans and that's it. Negative, neutral, and positive. At any given moment, if you assess what you're thinking, those are the three categories that our thoughts fall into. Those three categories elicit different sets of emotions. Um, we have to be able to uncover those, understand them, and then decide as a team with your patient how to switch them, okay? So the first thing is you have to understand that there's a connection. Do you remember Rich's example earlier? He kind of had to go through it quickly because he was in a hurry. Pretend you're waiting for a friend and they're late. If you just sit there and read and wait, you're pretty neutral, right? But if you think, you know, I knew she wasn't gonna show up. Or, you know, the last time we did this, she did this. What are those words? They're falling into that negative category, right? What kind of emotions are you starting to feel? If you stop and go, oh, I'm, I can't believe I haven't seen her in, you know, three years, I'm so excited. Where, where are those words and thoughts? They're going into the positive side. And what's happening to your body? You're feeling pretty good, okay? We do that as humans, so let's start to kind of do that with our tinnitus patients. Um, this is a great slide you can use with them if you want to go through that uh, example. The doorbell rings, you, go, you answer it, who's there? Nowadays, I don't think people ring doorbells, so maybe we should change this to the cell phone. Phone rings, you go to answer it, big deal. Phone rings the first, first time, it's someone on the other end really upset something horrible happened. You put the phone down, it rings again, something else really horrible happens. By the time the, the, ring, the phone rings the third time, you're prepared for this negative comment, this negative reaction. If the phone rings the first time and it's some great news, you feel really good, happens again, you're like, wow, I'm having the best day ever. The next time it rings, you're not expecting to fall into that category of being anxious because you've had this experience of feeling good twice. In all of this, what did the phone do? Just rang. But we as humans put emotions on things. So your tinnitus is just ringing its physiology. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. We learned that today. We put all kinds of emotions on it, and we turn it into something. Once we identify the unhealthy negative thoughts, then we start to try to figure out how to move over. Um, some slides that can help you with this. It, this is really simple, you guys. All you have to do is ask, get a piece of paper out and say, how do you feel about your tinnitus? Start taking notes. People will tell you. There's a lot of emotion there. Um, how do you want to restructure them? Do you want to take that thought and just maybe let's try to neutralize it a little bit? I used to try really hard to get some of my patients to like their tinnitus. <laughs> and, and eventually people would say, I can't get there, Shelly. doesn't matter what you say. I will never like it. OK, can we hate it a little bit less? That would be going from negative to neutral. And these are some slides that can help you with that. Okay, I was walking through an elementary school. And I wasn't supposed to have my phone on. And I, caught these, I took these pictures real quick. They had a big. Um, poster board or whatever you call, you guys know what I'm talking about. And they had on the top the title, Words Matter. And underneath, look at what these kids are looking at. This is nothing than changing from negative to neutral or more positive. Words matter. I made a mistake. Well, where does that throw you? Into the negative side and how does that make you feel? Pretty defeated. Mistakes help me improve. Hey, 
kind of empowers you. I can't read. Well, that just kind of ends it all. I'm not going to try. I'm going to train my brain to read. How cool is that? Now, teachers are doing this. They're not psychologists. They're not cognitive behavioral therapists. So we can do the same thing. All right, more slides to help you with that. If you don't want to start here because you may be a little nervous or overwhelmed, start in this section, helping, them, helping your patient focus on other areas of their life. Remember, you're walking into the room. You have a person who's very bothered. You do the introduction. You let them talk. You listen. You start to educate. And you say on day one, what's something you really like to do? Well, I love to take walks, but I can't anymore. Why can't you? Because of my tinnitus. This week, I want you to take three walks, regardless of your tinnitus. That's getting them going in the focusing on other areas. And we have a whole section of that for you. Okay? And then lastly, we all know this as audiologists, you can help them start reducing the contrast of having to always hear their tinnitus by implementing some background sound. And if they don't want to do this through a sound therapy evaluation and devices, that's OK. But they can do it other ways. Um, and one exercise you can give to them that first day, if this is what comes out in your discussion, go do some sound searching. For the next week until I see you, go listen to lots of different sounds and tell me when you come take notes. Do any of them help? Do any of them make your tinnitus less noticeable? One area that I think every tinnitus patient will agree is something about being in the shower. And I don't know if it's physically being in the shower, the actual act, warm water, or if it's the loudness of the water, or if it's the water sound. So what else gives you that relief? And then we have lots of activities that we've put in here for you to try and use. Okay, we can talk about this more tomorrow. So to review, um, this is a counseling and sound therapy based program. It's picture based, it's focused on those four areas. I highly recommend you pull out our 12 item questionnaire and use that because I think it's very simple and easy to use. Um, we love our ENT visits, we encourage it. We like copies of the audiogram. Um, we have a great group session, and then we break into individual sessions. Consider that sound therapy evaluation, which I think is so helpful. So many people really enjoy that session.